Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Eric Budish and I have the privilege of serving as the uh, faculty moderator of this remarkable uh, panel reflecting on the, the crisis of, of the past, uh, uh, past year or so. Uh, and I'm also welcome to over 300 of you who are, are with us, uh, with us virtually. We're all getting used to uh, being together, uh, being together apart. Uh, and th thank, thank you to all of our alums for, for being with us today. Um, the costs of the past year have been enormous in, in at least four dimensions, so health, economic activity, uh, human capital, and I think it's fair to say basic, uh, basic human happiness. Uh, in, a, in a paper I recently published in, in Science with a large set of colleagues, we used a figure for the total global cost of the pandemic uh, of a trillion dollars per month. Uh, and we suspect that that figure is quite conservative. It's easy to get to multiples uh, of that. Uh, this past year has also been a stress test of many of our public institutions and so national, state, and local governments, universities, school systems, global and national health authorities. And I think we can all agree, the panelists here today and our broader community, that the grades across the board are not straight A's. There have been some high marks and some low marks, but not, not straight A's across the board. Um, to give just one example from, from my own research, if, if we'd gotten smart about masks, tests, and particularly high-risk activities, what we now call super spreader events, earlier, uh, we could have both prevented countless unnecessary deaths and avoided uh, severe lockdowns. And, and to give just one more example, because what, what faculty member can resist uh, yapping about their own research, if the world had invested more in vaccine production capacity uh, early on, as my collaborators, collaborators and I recommended, we could have been on track to vaccinate the world by uh, October of this year, rather than looking out to uh, mid, sometime mid to late of 2022. Um, today, we have a, a remarkable panel of leaders from, from government, education, health, and the private sector, uh, all alums of Chicago Booth, uh, to reflect on this past year and, and share their lessons as, as we look ahead. Uh, let me introduce first President Elizabeth Bradley, the president of uh, Vassar College, a member of uh, the New York Forward Reopening Advisory Committee who helped draft the guidelines for New York's higher education reopening, formerly a professor of public health at Yale who's published over 300 peer-reviewed papers, puts my own publication record to shame, not surprisingly, uh, and, three, and three books, including The American Healthcare Paradox, Why Spending More is Getting Us Less. Uh, she also has a recent paper in, in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association on COVID testing and higher education that I'm sure will come up uh, in today's discussion. Uh, second, Richard, uh, Richard Freeman, who's had numerous leadership roles at Goldman Sachs, uh, currently as chairman of Goldman's uh, Asset Management Division, a member of the firm's management committee, uh, chair of the firm's merchant banking division, of which he was also global head uh, for 20 years. Uh, Rich is also co-chair of the board of trustees of the Mount Sinai Health System uh, and served as kind of an executive chairman function uh, during the heat of the crisis. And I'm sure he'll be reflecting on, uh, on that experience uh, in this panel discussion. He's also the founder of the Friedman Brain Institute at Mount Sinai. Uh, and last, Governor Pete Ricketts, uh, the governor of Nebraska, sworn in in January of 2015, re-elected to a second term in 2018. Uh, governor Ricketts previously had numerous leadership roles at Ameritrade, running strategy, marketing, product development, uh, serving as president and chief operating officer. Uh, and, and last but not least, a, a previous member of the board of the, the Chicago Cubs. Um, in, in this panel, we'll first hear from each of our distinguished panelists uh, with some reflections from the past year, and then I'll, I'll moderate a discussion among the group, which I hope will have plenty of crosstalk uh, and Chicago seminar uh, spirit. Uh, we'll have uh, audience Q&A uh, as well. If, if you'd like to ask a question from the audience, please do so uh, using the Zoom uh, Q&A feature. Uh, but without further ado, let me, uh, let me hand the floor to Governor Ricketts. Thank you for being with us here today. My, my, great. Uh, my pleasure, Dr. Budish. Thank you very much uh, for having me on and uh, appreciate everybody joining the call today. This should be fun. So let's set the stage going back about a year. On February 7th, Nebraska took uh, some of the first, should we call them, pandemic refugees from China coming in from Wuhan. Uh, we put them up at Camp Ashland, which is one of our National Guard camps. 
And then on February 17th, we started taking some evacuees from the Diamond Princess uh, because the University of Nebraska Medical Center has the only federally funded quarantine unit in the country. And we were selected for both of those missions because of the expertise of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, uh, having one of three biocontainment areas uh, or you know, units in the country that we had for the last 10 years and had been working, for example, with Ebola patients and evacuated those from Africa to treat uh, that very infectious disease there, very deadly disease. Uh, so early on, we had, uh, maybe I probably had a little bit more advanced warning than some of my other colleagues around the country and tapped into some expertise that maybe my colleagues didn't have. And so we uh, put together a plan that focused on, um, in fact, I got some good pieces of early advice. One was, it's a virus, you can't stop it. It's going to get here, it's going to spread. All you can do is slow it down enough to preserve your hospital capacity. And so that's what we did is we focused on that single metric of hospitalization. Again, you may recall early on, we didn't really have a good way to test and nobody really knew what to look for anyway. I mean, as far as like what would be good testing, you know, you probably heard a lot about positivity rates, uh, rates and cases. But again, if people, if you don't have tests, you can't tell cases. And if you're testing the wrong population, it's not exactly a random sample. So the positivity rate doesn't necessarily mean anything. So we put together a plan that involved six pieces initially. Uh, it was around creating testing, doing contact tracing, which is the second kind of line of effort or pillar of our plan to follow up those folks who tested positive, getting personal protective equipment out to our law enforcement, first responders, healthcare workers. That was our third pillar. Our fourth pillar was to create a place where people could go if they could not go home, either because they didn't want to bring the virus home from work or they didn't want to take the virus from home into work. That was called the Nebraska Accommodation Project where we uh, opened that up to teachers, meat processing workers, law enforcement, first responders, general public, and so forth. Then we had our fourth, uh, our fifth line of effort was creating plans around at-risk communities like long-term care facilities or meat processing. And then uh, number six was just the directed health measures we would put in place. Now, uh, when I'm talking about directed health measures, in some states, that meant uh, stay-at-home orders, lockdowns, uh, mask mandates. We did not do any of that here in Nebraska. We did not have a statewide mask mandate. We did not have a directed stay-at-home order. And we'll probably talk more about this uh, in the future. We just did a lot of communication asking Nebraskans to do the right thing. Uh, we also um, really focused a lot on communication, which I think we'll talk about um, a little bit more later in the hour here as well. Ultimately, by putting together this plan and working with, uh, I got a great team um, in, at the state government, tapped into you know, the excellence that we have at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Uh, we've been able to weather this pandemic pretty well here in Nebraska. Uh, we focus on hospitalizations. We have been always able, we treat our entire hospital system as one big system across the state. So we move patients around from city to city if we needed to to make sure we would always have hospital beds available in a given location. And so we were always able to provide that hospital bed, that ICU bed or that ventilator to anybody who needed it when they needed it. We didn't have the problems like in California where you may have seen you know, people backing up in emergency rooms or being turned away. That didn't happen here in Nebraska. The um, other result was that we kept our mortality rates down. Uh, we have one of some of the lowest mortality rates per 100,000 here in Nebraska uh, as defined by statistica.com. Uh, while keeping uh, that all, you know, pr providing that hospital care to people and keeping mortality rates down, we've also been able to keep kids in school. I think we're the sixth best state uh, as far as throughout this past school year having kids in the classrooms, which has been very important. Uh, we had the lowest unemployment rate on average throughout 2020. Uh, we've got the lowest unemployment rate right now in the country at 2.9%. In fact, our unemployment rate right now is lower than it was in February of last year. So we actually have a lower unemployment right now than we did previously. Uh, we had the sixth fastest growing economy in, uh, uh, in the fourth quarter of this year at growing at over 6%. And on average, our economy did about the seventh best overall throughout 2020. So balancing off all those things, we tried to strike a balance between slowing the spread of the virus and letting people live a more normal life, which, which has allowed us to achieve the, the success we've achieved so far. And now as we um, enter the vaccination phase, that's kind of our seventh pillar. Uh, we uh, consistently um, have, we're like we're number five as far as uh, vaccinating vulnerable populations. Last I checked, we were like number 
11 or 12, as far as 65 year olds, we really focused on 65 year olds. And that's what's dramatically kept down our hospitalizations. Uh, our hospital bed capacity right now is about 3.3% of overall hospital beds are taking up with COVID patients. So we've got that all managed and we just continue to focus on getting, uh, you know, shots in arms, which is increasingly becoming more and difficult as we've got the low hanging fruit, uh, as far as, you know, overcoming vaccine resistance and that education to get people to take the vaccines. So with that, Dr. Budish, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Governor Ricketts. Um, let me turn the floor to, uh, to President Elizabeth Bradley. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Budish, for putting this all together. And I'm really honored to be here with Governor Ricketts. And um, I don't know, is it Dr. Friedman or Mr. Friedman? I'm not sure. Rich oh, Friedman. Uh, Rich. <laughs> Rich. Uh, but in any case, um, really appreciate the opportunity. So um, I'll reflect a little bit on our experience at Vassar. Uh, Vassar is in the state of New York, about an hour and a half from New York City. Um, we have 2,500 students and about 1,800 staff. Uh, and we live in an area that is in a city, but still very easy to cordon off. We have a thousand acre campus. Um, and so we decided that we were gonna be the New Zealand of higher education when this hit in March. And um, we decided that we would take a strategy of creating a perimeter around the campus, which is an imaginary perimeter. It's a psychological one. We didn't put up walls or anything. And say, if students, you want to come back, you have to stay on the campus. And um, that was a huge undertaking because we all know um, between the years, we all remember being between the years of 18 and 22, you don't exactly do what the administrator on the campus tells you to do. So one of our largest, um, I think creative moments was figuring out how to convert what is typically peer pressure into something very positive for a community. And um, with a group that we called Vassar Together, we convened faculty, uh, students, administrators, staff to say, how are we gonna make this work? How can we create a bubble, if you will, to keep ourselves safe? And even as employees are going off and on the campus, that is a minimal risk compared to students going off campus, bringing the virus back on um, and then living together and eating together and whatnot. Um, and Vassar together really came up with a whole set of expectations under the rubric of we precedes me, which is you know kind of a corny statement, but at the end of the day, I think every student on this campus knows it now. And something that's sort of a silver lining if there ever could be, which I, you know, there's nothing good about this pandemic. However, one thing we really learned um, was the concept of young adults really seeing themselves as part of something bigger than themselves and understanding they got to compromise their own desire to go party, get down to New York City in order to keep their friends safe. And I, as you know, witnessing this from an older adult level, I thought it's like fascinating because it's a part of education that often we miss. We get all the cognitive stuff, but that empathic and sort of mature sense that one is part of something bigger than themselves. Um, I'll say that it was interesting to, to navigate the boundary once we put up like this bubble mentality. We, of course, did not want to leave our community in the lurch. You know, our students basically, subsidize, you know, they're a lot of the business for um, businesses in Poughkeepsie and Arlington. So uh, we started to make deals with all the businesses around to come onto campus in a very careful way for Munchy Monday and Tasty Tuesday and, you know, you name it. Uh, barbershops set up right in the middle of the quad and, you know, hair braiding and um, really tried to bring the town onto campus in a very um, sort of careful, careful way. Um, there And that that actually proved really helpful because I know there were some universities that the towns got upset that they brought all the students back because maybe they were infecting everybody else. So we really, I think, assured our community that we were keeping them safe as well as ourselves safe. Um, Ultimately, it's all about the outcome. So um, we had some hard days right in February when it was dark and you had to be inside and we had just brought everyone back for spring break after being globally away for the winter break. Um, those were some hard days in the beginning, but we never had to shut down or cancel classes. So um, we've stayed at an average of about seven cases um, over a week. Um, and that's been very containable. We have isolation area and we have quarantine. It's been, it's been modest, the amount of disease that's been on campus. Um, in addition, our faculty were very brave souls and um, they taught. We put up 18 tents 
and they taught intense um, with a whole new technologic sophistication because we had to sort of teach for the students who came back to campus, which was 85%, but we also had to teach the students who stayed home, which is about 15% in a tent with IT and it worked. Um, so I'd say about 70% of our classes ultimately were in person, um, at least at some point during the semester and about 30% totally online. Um, coming back for this fall, I think the challenge now is to think, how do we psychologically get out of this bubble? How do we get out of you know, the sense that we have to be six feet apart at all times and we can't even be outside without a mask. You know, in, in Poughkeepsie, everybody's in a mask all the time, two masks in fact. And so emerging from that cocoon, I think will be um, easy to write policy for, but harder you know, to really redevelop that, um, the old days of what community is. But we're looking forward to that challenge. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to ask you later about teaching in a tent. That sounds okay. Uh, I don't. Let, me, let me hand the floor to, 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 to Rich Friedman. Mr. Mr. Rich Friedman, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Um, and I'm very, very happy to be here. So I'll give you a little bit of my journey through this because it's been really a, um, it, was, it, it became a crusade. So in the early days, uh, and this was in November and December, my investment colleagues you know, at Goldman Sachs in China were telling us about what, what was going on with them. And this is in November, December uh, in Beijing um, and Shanghai that they were quarantined and they were told to stay in their homes. And we were hearing stories over a four to six week period about um, you know, some of our colleagues you know, literally not being allowed to go outside, being able to go on a certain day to go to the supermarket and then hearing about them giving haircuts to their kids. So we actually were here, we were getting advance notice of what, we, of what was there because our investment professionals were sort of, and, and they're, you know, in, in, in China, very clearly everyone was very compliant. So it wasn't a matter of, you know, well, maybe I'll listen today or tomorrow. Everyone did what they were told to do. The next, you know, sort of part of the journey was in January, I asked the CEO of the Mount Sinai Health System at one of our committee meetings, I said, Ken, so what do you what do you think about you know um, you know this this virus in Wuhan? And he was a little short with me, and he basically said, "Rich, don't go to Wuhan." So that's early January. That's a little bit of what his knee jerk reaction was that he wasn't thinking it's coming our way. Roll the clock forward a month. Scott Gottlieb, who we've all seen on CNBC, um, he's on he's on our board. He's a graduate of the uh, Mount Sinai Medical uh, School. He's on our board, and I said, Scott. What do you think about what's going on? I was going to a medical school uh, committee meeting. This is early February. And he says, Rich, I'm very worried about this. Uh, I think this is very serious. Um, now, he didn't say it's coming our way, but he said, I'm very, very serious. So this is early February. March 1st, I get a call from Ken Davis, Sunday night, 7 o'clock. We have our first patient at Mount Sinai. And they were two... Um, two researchers who had just flew back from the Middle East. And I think, and this became reminiscent of what then happened over time, which was husband and wife, the, um, the wife tested positive, the husband tested negative. They both had the same symptoms and they were basically quarantined in their quote unquote student housing, if you will. They both had the disease. But it's just a little reminiscent of what was to come in terms of the bad testing uh, and the things that were out there, you know, at that time. So, um, but when this really took off was on St. Patrick's Day. Um, I had been, I had moved, I had flown from Florida out to Bridgehampton. Goldman Sachs's offices were basically shutting at that point in time. And I would say from there forward, um, you know, as Eric said, I really saw myself, my capacity was really being the executive chair of Mount Sinai to help guide us through and work with the management team to get through this. And the first mission that happened was, um, uh, Ken Davis told me that we have five tons of PPE sitting in the Shanghai airport and we have no way to get it out. They had amassed it through a relationship we had with a insurance company um, in China, uh, but they had no way to get it out. And I reached into my experience base because I happen to have been in, um, in China uh, during 9-11. And I happened to sort of run into Hank Paulson, who was the chairman of Goldman Sachs at the time. 
and uh, he had a plane from NetJets that he had flown over there for. Uh, and I was able to hitch a ride back uh, on that Thursday night. And they, he, they did everything possible to sort of get through, get the, all the approvals needed to come back. So my first instinct on how to get five tons of mask, goggles, and um, face shields was to sort of call NetJets. So I literally, I just called my secretary. I said, Renee, call NetJets and get two, two Global 6000 planes getting ready to go to Anchorage. And then we're going to send it over to um, Shanghai. And then I said to my, you know, I was talking to Ken Davis and I said, you know, I think we may, may, may need to, to escalate this a little bit. So I called David Solomon, who then called Warren Buffett. And in three minutes, literally three minutes, I was on the phone with the CEO of NetJets. Uh, and this then went on a four day journey to get these two planes to go not to Shanghai, but they were moved to Nanjing. And this was a very dramatic four day period because every time we thought we had had it, all the clearances, you know, we ran into roadblocks. So this became a real mission over, over these four days because China wasn't letting planes in or they weren't letting planes out at that point in time. They closed their airspace. You know, we, um, we just wanted to fly in, pick up the equipment and leave. Um, I used a lot of the relationships I had from the business side with, um, you know, leaders in the business community in China to help you know, with the, you know, the, the politicians there and the mayor of in fact, Nanjing is where we moved the equipment to. Uh, and then we needed to get to the head of the airport. Um, so I had my Goldman Sachs team on the ground working with the um, elected officials and, and you know, some of the people from China. And we had gotten it all approved to go there on Wednesday. As we were ready to launch, give the you know, signal to the planes in Anchorage, a plane from the UK into, Bay, into this Nanjing airport was carrying 33 people who were known to have COVID. So everyone at the airport basically left our project and they basically had to deal with 33 because Ch what China did was they were maniacal about dealing with any cases that came in. So all of a sudden I went to bed at like one or two in the morning saying, you know, we lost it. And we really didn't know whether or not we were gonna get approval because at one point the chairman of this insurance company who had helped get the equipment, he had three of his sons in Florida and he had asked whether or not I would fly them back to Beijing or to Nanjing as part of this mission, if you will. And I said, of course, he, told, he basically said not necessary. And when he told me that I was worried he knew something that I didn't know that they, we, we would never actually get the planes in. But we got the planes in on that Thursday night, the next day, everything went fine. And we stuffed 4,500 4, tons of PPE in. Now, what was driving my thinking on this was that my son was a fourth year resident at Mount Sinai. He was in the, in, in the neuro ICUs and then called into the ICU. So I was personalizing this. To me, the first thing I was focused on is how do we protect our front line? And if we protect our front line, we're gonna save lives. So that was my whole thinking is stay focused on this, get the equipment back, do everything possible. And that became my North Star during that whole period. How do we take care of our frontline workers? So first it was focused on getting the equipment needed to protect them. Then for about a two week period, we focused on getting provisions for them, getting food, hydration, places to stay, hotels, because ultimately this was unfolding in, in, in a way that no one could have ever imagined. I mean, in, in our worst days, in the early days, we were getting 250 new hospital patients coming in to be hospitalized every day for, for weeks. A year ago at this time, we had 2,200 patients across our health system. When I talked to my son in his second or third, third day in, in there, and he was a, he's a neurologist, he said, dad, you know, they call me into the uh, ICUs when they have um, either strokes or encephalopathies or they're delirious. And he, he said, he goes, and they just called me, I probably saw, you know, 15 patients. He said, dad, every one of them died. So it was, it became personalizing to me what was going on. So, you know, over the next 75 days, my role there was to think about what I could make, where I could make a difference. And I had it in a number of places. One was fundraising. We needed to raise money, money to basically deal with provisioning for the staff. But we also were doing a lot of research during this period 
and we were cre we created basically a an antibody test that became you know basically a, the state of the art a quantitative test that we that is now commercialized and actually in the early days one of the fun things that we you know we learned about was we actually did the testing of congress and we also did the testing um, at the White House. Now, unfortunately, they didn't tell us exactly, they didn't tell us the labeling. So we really, it was an, 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 you know, anonymized. So we really didn't know who had had it and who didn't have it. But we, um, we raised a lot of money, we needed to invest, and, and, but we couldn't worry about how bad the financial impact to the hospitals were because they were so bad, we knew we needed federal, you know, federal aid or we were not gonna be able to financially make it. This was all the big hospitals. But this surge, and we've actually made a movie about this, that we believe that we're going to bring out over the next, you know, two three months, and it's a it's a it's an uplifting movie of what really went on during this period, personalized stories of the nurses, the doctors, and the patients who who, who you know who, who you know and what they endured. So um, you know, to tell a few fun stories about you know what what I had to encounter as executive chair, I was negotiating with Elon Musk. We were able to get 200 ventilators that we needed. They weren't exactly the ventilators we needed, but we used them. <laughs> we had a surreal, um, a surreal uh, Zoom with the CEO of Mount Sinai, the dean of the medical school, Jack Dorsey from Square. And five minutes before the call, he called me up and said, Rich, is it okay if I invite uh, Sean Penn to the Zoom? Uh, and I said, sure, bring Sean Penn on. Uh, and the reason we were trying to reach Jack Dorsey is he had pledged to put a billion dollars, you know, towards, you know, helping what was going on with poverty, with food insecurity. And we were hoping to get him to, and he asked me to put on Sean Penn. So there we are, the hospital leadership with Sean Penn. And Sean Penn starts right about how he's been getting all of the frontliners uh, tested and how he's doing this for three minutes. And then at the end of the call, the Dean said to me, he goes, I don't know who that guy was, but he seemed very depressed. <laughs> I said, I think that's how he always is. Um, and, and then the, the last thing I'll say, and, and, and President Bradley, this, you'll, you'll like this because you said, am I Dr. Friedman? We were doing a lot of promotional stuff to raise money, uh, a lot of creative things. So I was able actually a year ago, right about now, to be in the NFL draft as part of like a, um, an, an advertising segment. And they put me with five rappers. And it was, it was a little humorous, but I, the, the, the announcer who was doing it kept referring to me as Dr. Friedman. Dr. Friedman, tell me what's going on. And I, and I just let it go but, because it was the, me with ra these rap artists, I have no idea who they were. But uh, you know, th this experience became a crusade for me. Uh, and I remember talking to David Solomon when I was you know, trying to you know, share experiences and, and see how we could help each other between Goldman and Mount Sinai. And all I said to him was this, I said, during this period, and I meant this, David, we will be remembered more for what we do during this, this crisis than any deal we ever worked on. No one's gonna care or remember this transaction or that transaction or anything else, but we need to lead our respective organizations and work together. And um, we did a lot of really good things. So, so this was a you know, horrendous period in New York. I feel like we did a, as well as we could have done at Mount Sinai, treating our patients, taking care of our frontline workers. And, um, you know, it's not over yet, but, um, you know, the trend is terrific. And uh, I learned a lot, you know, I became like the Corona kid because, you know, I was able to learn a lot about the science and a lot about, you know, the vaccines. And then also more importantly, I was able to help a lot of my friends and colleagues when they got sick. So this was really a, a momentous period and, you know, it's not over, but, you know, that, that 75 days was a period to remember. And um, I will say the, the leadership at Mount Sinai really rose to the occasion and everyone worked together with the same common goals. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to all, all three of you. I, I, I want to ask a question, uh, start up some, some panel discussion. Uh, and I want to start with a question about leadership in a crisis and I'll, I'll riff off something uh, Rich said and pose, pose the question to Governor Ricketts and President Bradley, uh, which is what, what were your, your North Stars in, in, in navigating, navigating your, you, you, you're both leaders of, of large, complex organizations, lots of different types of constituencies, um, massive communications challenges, hard trade-offs to, to grapple with. What were your what were your north stars and leadership principles? Let me 
turn it to the governor for governor and then and President Bradley. Sure. So the thing that we focused on was what I mentioned in my opening there, which was hospitalizations. You know, as I kind of referenced, we didn't have a lot of testing early on. And one of the things we did is work with a private company called Nomi Health to get Test Nebraska set up, which is one of the few burden-free, cost-free testing programs uh, that we had among all the states. And that really helped us do more testing. But uh, frankly, you're like I said, it's not a random sample. So you're relying on people to go get tested. Sometimes they don't go get tested. Um, so if you start looking at case counts, those can be misleading because it depends on how much testing you actually have. If you, I know there's a lot of talk about positivity rates. That was equally a manipulable type measurement. Uh, there were multiple ways to count positivity rate. Didn't really mean anything. So we focused on hospitalizations because if you're sick, you're going to go to the hospital, right? Whether you test positive for coronavirus or not, if you're that sick, you're going to the hospital. So that's what we really focused on. And we knew that if we had too many coronavirus patients going to the hospital, that not only would that compromise their care, but also the care that other, you know, emergency type uh, health and issues, acute issues, we're going to uh, be taking, uh, we're going to get poor care as well. So that's what we really focused on. And that's what the, you know, kind of that six pronged mm -hmm. approach I talked about really focused right. on and the vaccines kind of came on as our seventh prong. So we really focused on that as our way to measure how we're doing it. In fact, we uh, got through that spring surge with only a couple hundred hospitalizations. And then like most of the upper Midwest, we saw a, including Illinois, we saw that surge that came on in the uh, fall. And we actually published our, you know, what, what we were using for our directed health measures. So at certain levels, whether we were, you know, blue, green, yellow, red, orange, red, whatever, was based all on our hospitalizations. So at certain levels of hospitalizations, we went to a different, more restrictive level of directed health measures. And we published all that so that it was very clear to everybody where it was. And we never moved those goalposts, same goalposts we have today, as a matter of fact. And so people, you know, for example, if you were a restaurant or bar owner, you knew that if we hit certain hospitalizations, you were gonna lose your in-dining cap capability and you have to go back to carry out and, you know, delivery only. So that everybody could kind of see what was going on and plan accordingly. And with that, it was a very clear way that everybody kind of understood how we were doing was that communication that we published it all. And so that was one of the things that really helped us be successful is we picked one thing, we stuck yeah. to it, we didn't change it, and it was very clear to everybody what was going on. So there's a, there was a metric that was clearly front and center in your decision-making and thought process. How did you, how did you personalize a, a, achieving that metric? So did, did you have in your, in your head archetypical Nebraskans, you know, the, you know, the work, the working family figuring out how to make ends meet. The small business owner. Do, do you want? How, how did how did you how did you translate that specific metric into how, just navigating the complex trade offs of, ma of managing this thing? Well, it, again, no, our, nobody in this country has gone through a pandemic in a century, so we we're all kind of making it up. Uh, it was based upon the feedback I got from a number of different sources. And I will tell you, this is one of my frustrations with uh, the public health officials we've had, is I was talking to a lot of epidemiologists who were probably great epidemiologists, but they were only looking at one new narrow part of this, which was the pandemic. Now it's an important part, but it didn't take into consideration things like, you know, I, in fact, one of our epidemiologists, not on my team, but at UMC, I was talking to him and I said, well, what about, you know, drug overdose deaths because of isolation and just that. What about domestic violence, child abuse, suicide rates, mental health issues in general? And his response back to me was, Governor, you're right. Somebody should be looking at that. It's not my job. I'm an epidemiologist. So I know one of the questions later on, maybe I'm jumping ahead of it, is what could be done better is that we didn't really have, the, the only person who was looking at the bigger picture was me and my team. Everybody else was focused on a very narrow part of this. So we were the ones that were talking with the restaurant association and with the small businesses and the state chambers and all that sort of thing to kind of get a global picture of how, when we put a restriction in place, was that gonna impact you? What could you actually do? So for example, I'll pick our restaurants. Uh, we worked very closely with them, get them feedback on, okay, if we did, if we were six feet apart on tables, can you manage that? What, what, you know, if, or is it better to do it on occupancy rates? Or, you know, so we, we basically tried to work with people who were gonna be impacted to come up with those metrics. And in part, I think that helped get their buy-in with regard to the measurement, you know, how we were actually structuring our restrictions so that they knew that at least they had a voice and they may not have been happy with it, 
but at least they had a little bit of a voice in how that was all coming out. Okay, thank you, Pre President Bradley. What were you? What was your? What was your North Star? How did you navigate? Yeah. How did you navigate? Um, well, I agree with so much of what Governor Ricketts said, and I would just add that um, at the very beginning, we sort of set a, um, a value base for what we were going to do, and it was March 12th, I think, that our senior team sat in this office and said, "Before we decide what we're going to do, we have to set our values. What are they?" Um, and so we did. And the first value, and we we came back to these all year, practically every time I give like an administrative forum or the faculty meeting, I remember, okay, let's remind ourselves what our values are. So they were first um, to protect our most vulnerable people, whether they were vulnerable due to health issues or they were vulnerable due to mental health issues or financial issues or social issues, we wanted to protect them. That really came from a lot of work that I've done in hospital administration before where, you know, what you wanted, no deaths. So as a college president, you know, I wasn't thinking in terms of deaths, but I was thinking our most vulnerable, you just never know, we got to protect them. Um, our second value was equity, that if we did something, we wanted to make it a whole of college response. So this worked out many, many times when we had to take um, financial cuts, you know, we had to hold salaries flat. <clears throat> Um, or could we allow the athletes to go off campus? Well, if we're gonna let them go off campus, we gotta let everybody else go off campus. So how are we gonna do that equitably? So that value really guided us a lot. Um, and our third value was our mission. You know, we want to give, and we do give the highest quality liberal arts education in a diverse and inclusive setting. So we constantly put things up against that. And as soon as you say, we're going to do that mission, you know you're not absolutely minimizing risk. As Governor Ricketts said, you, you really gotta optimize the risk. And maybe that's a University of Chicago point. Um, you know, you gotta think about, well, we could, you know, set up sentries around the campus so no one ever leaves, but gosh, what is the impact of that? People get depressed and it feels like a police state. So of course we're not gonna do that. We're gonna take the risk. And um, kind of centering on these values and particularly the mission allowed us to take more risks than I think, you know, at the beginning, some people thought we would, because ultimately, I think people really understood risk optimization rather than risk elimination. I think that that, that does um, echo a lot of University of Chicago <laughs> thinking. You know, it's constrained <laughs> optimization. You're 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 faced with this new new set of challenges. If you ignore the virus, it's going to blow up out of control. If you optimize only on the virus, you're going to do well on that one dimension, but there's so yeah. many other demands. So it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a pretty price theory 101. It's, it's a yeah. I'm I'm optimization. Probably problem. breaking the rules by jumping in here, but I just please, want to please say, do. Bradley, I wish I'd heard more of that from anybody else besides me <laughs> and my team. Yeah. Because that's what we needed to hear more of from people is that, hey, look, we, it is about risk. It's not, it's not risk elimination, risk mitigation. Well, we still have the opportunity as we are opening up now and really coming back. I, I hear all the time, I can't go back to work because of this, that, or the other, but really we've got to get across to people, harm reduction and risk optimization. We can't think risk elimination. We never have been risk-free. I don't know why we ever thought we were. Well, let, let me, let's, I was going to say, what, what it's, a, it's, a, it's a seminar, so let's, let's uh, go, go for it, please. Well, I was going to say, so one of the things that I, I talked about early on in one of my press conferences was finding the right speed. I said, you know, we can reduce nearly all highway deaths in this country right. by reducing the interstate speed down to five miles an hour. Exactly. But we don't do that. Right. So, what, you know, so, you know, March of 2020, I was talking, or April 2020, I was talking about, we got to find the right speed. What are, what are, the, what are we going to slow down to find, to make, to, to strike that balance and slow it down? What, what's your theory? Let me put this question to the whole panel. What, what's your theory of the case on the, on the communications challenge? of why it was so hard to strike that, uh, that note of, of balancing of risk. And there's, the, there's the very initial crisis period where it was kind of a collective, holy, you know, whatever curse word you wanna, uh, wanna use, where but let's sort of give ourselves a couple of weeks of panic, let's assess where, what, we're, what we're up against. Um, but then going, going forward from that initial moment of crisis and panic, strikes me that this public discussion about complex trade-offs, balancing risks, what kind, of, what kind of behavior is risky? What kind of behavior is not that risky? It's not zero, you know, driving on the highway is not a zero, but, but you know, if you're driving on the highway and you got your seatbelt buckled and you got an airbag and you're obeying the speed limit, it's daytime. You know, 
So what, what's your, I, I, what's your I think, theory of the case on the communication? Yeah, I would say, I, I'd say early on, the unknowns were just too many. Uh, and I think the uh, anxiety over, you know, wh wh what are the fatality rates? And th there was much more of, you know, my analogy would be is people thinking that this was more like Ebola rather than what it was. So I think the fear of, you know, um, you know, uh, of how bad this disease was and all of the unknowns, because no one really knew anything. And then I'd say, I, I think we were let down by our, you know, national leadership. Because, you know, this is a case where we needed this, you know, governing leadership to get the right messages out. And I think what was happening is what we were getting in, you know, we were getting conflicting messages. We were getting, you know, messages that were, you know, not factually true. You know, we, we'd be watching wh whatever you watch, whether it's CNN or MSNBC or whatever. And all we'd be hearing about is all the negative things about what's being told to us. So I, I think the communication challenge really started that we needed great leadership from the, from the, you know, the White House um, on a federal level and we didn't get it. And I think that then, because as, as the governor said, there was no manual for this. There was no playbook for this. So we were all sort of you know, managing on a daily basis in the, in the beginnings of crisis management to save lives, protect our environments, protect our people. But we kept getting inconsistent messages on, you know, how to behave, wear a mask, don't wear a mask. And so this, the, the politicizing of what went on really made it, I think, very challenging. And it still is very challenging when we're dealing with vaccine hesitancy, return to office, as President Bradley was saying. It, you know, we may be getting through the infection phase in the United States, but I'll return to normalcy, we're a long ways away because, uh, frankly, no one no one trusts what they hear from our government at this point, unfortunately. Um, I would have, I, I agree with what you've just said about the politicizing versus scientific, you know, thinking. But um, even before that, I, I sort of think of Kahneman and Tversky. Now, I know these are Yale people, not University of Chicago people, but um, and all their- <laughs> I'm sorry. But you know, how people make mistakes in estimating risk all the time. And if something is highly available and it's very salient what's going to happen and it could be severe like death, people overestimate the risk of that all the time. And I think we had a kind of perfect storm on that where, you know, it was extremely available on the news all the time what was happening. Um, yeah, you could die. And just the whole thing is so salient because it, it could hit anybody. So you put that together, it's like a perfect storm for people overestimating the risk. I think the part that... Um, Mr. Friedman brought up about politicizing is sort of the underestimate of risk. So I think like in an odd way, we were making both mistakes, panicked and yet not alert enough to say, actually, we all need masks. We have to get testing early and now we're gonna have to get vaccines because then that, that response I think has been extremely politicized, which is identical to what happened in, um, in 1918. So unfortunately, you know, reading the history doesn't bode well for us really estimating risk appropriately. Yeah, you know, communication was one of the things that we did a lot of. And so I mean, a couple of things to hit upon. One, getting back to nobody's ever done this before. So I disagree with you, Rich, that we got bad leadership in general from the, the White House, particularly because I'll tell you, I talked to Dr. Fauci. Go look at him today. That guy's all over the map. Uh, he told my colleague um, in North Dakota that she was going to have 10,000 hospitalizations. At her peak, she reached 607. So there's a lot of like, okay, so that's top little leadership. That's not the White House, that's CDC or NIH or whoever it is. And they don't know what's going on. So I think the, the thing was, we got to remember this country, emergencies are managed in the way that, you know, locally executed, state managed, federally supported. I didn't want the federal government stepping in and trying to tell Nebraskans how to do something because what's right for New York is not going to be right for Nebraska and vice versa. So I wanted to manage at the state level, and that's what I was allowed to do. And so the way we handled the communication part is I was talking to people a lot. We had daily phone calls with health officials all across the state, generally, we, and we're still doing them now twice a week. There's about 100 people on those calls or 130 or more sometimes. So we did a lot of that just to kind of disseminate what the information was. Public health officials were on that. Our UNMC, everybody had a chance to weigh in. So that was one of the calls, but also... I was on calls with our municipalities, with our counties, with my local health directors. Uh, you know, obviously my team met significantly. 
At the peak, we were also doing seven press conferences a week. So five in English, two in Spanish. So it was a lot of that communication out to people for what was here in Nebraska that really worked to overcome what, you know, what people's, you know, fears were. And that's how I got so much feedback afterwards that people said it just, you know, we were on, we were on every day at 10 AM and the news channels all covered us. And people told me, it makes me feel better to hear you talk about what we know, what we don't know, what we did right, the mistakes we made, but it was all a very, you know, straightforward conversation about what was going on in Nebraska. And, you know, getting back to some of the, the politicizing things, like I said, we didn't do a statewide mask mandate, but we asked people to, to uh, you know, wear a mask when they went to the store and educated people why that would help them, why that would help slow down the spread of the virus. We didn't do a stay at home order, but we did uh, 21 days to stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. By, oh, by the way, we had weekly calls with my colleague governors around the country. And I stole that idea from Doug Burgum in North Dakota and Doug Ducey in Arizona. And I didn't even give him any credit till just now. So, uh, you know, so we, we borrowed other ideas, but we, did, but we did ask people to stay home, stay healthy, stay connected to be able to, you know, flatten the curve. So we did a lot of communication around all these different ideas, but I would not have wanted it to come from the federal government because that's a one size fit all answer for the entire country. And that's not, this country is not uniform like that. I wanted to manage it within the state of Nebraska and that's the opportunity I got to do. So what are, this is a question, question that's on my mind and a question uh, fr from the audience, which is how do, this is to, to the whole panel, but how do we, how do governments do better uh, in the next pandemic? What are the, what are the lessons we take from what what worked well this time around and what the, the failings were this time around uh, as we think ahead to future, uh, future analogous or maybe quite, quite different um, uh, pandemic situations. Uh, and the next one might, might have the same, uh, same kinds of characteristics as, as coronavirus where it spreads with an R of three and it, is such and such infection fatality rate, or more might be something massively different uh, in terms of how it's in terms of how it spreads and how lethal it is. Like, what's the how, how do we do better next time around? What are the lessons we take from this one to do better next time? This is a, for the whole whole panel and any any order. I'll, I'll let the order be uh, be organic. <laughs> Anyone would like to take well, it first? There's a, there's a couple of things I think we could do better just from having sat in the chair of a governor and, and dealing with local governments as well as the federal government. I think as a state, the one thing I could have asked for more of is more access to people like Dr. Fauci to understand what he was thinking, you know, directly to talk, to be able to talk to him. We set up phone calls that, uh, you know, we did have uh, Vice President Pence there, and it was much more about the response to it rather than kind of the underlying science of what we knew, what we didn't know. So it was much more, shall we say, logistics oriented rather than science oriented. Now, we had great science resources here in Nebraska, so... I was actually you know, benefited from that, but I think that that would have been helpful to be able to, to understand more about what the CDC was thinking about this directly. Because I got to tell you, there, nobody knew anything about this. One of the CDC doctors was on assignment here in Nebraska, came and showed me that we were going to have 43,000 deaths in Nebraska by June, which is crazy. You, you dug into his numbers and said, I, I said, that assumes a 90% attack rate. Nobody's predicting that. So there were clearly, I mean, like, there were epidemiologists. I mean, again, I don't want to try and fall down because nobody knew what was going on, but that was one example of somebody who I looked at his data where he presented, I dug into his data. I said, this is crazy. You better have something better than this. And I would have liked to have known if there was somebody else in the CDC who actually had a more rational thought about how they were approaching this. Um, I had to deal with the CDC guy that was assigned to Nebraska. Uh, so that would be one thing. Um, so having that access there. And the other thing is just having somebody who is, who can look at the bigger picture that I talked about who could really advise us on things like other health costs of the suicides, the domestic violence, the child abuse, and that sort of thing. So we weren't just hearing from the slowing the spread of the virus, but looking at a bigger picture about what are all the different trade-offs that we could analogize to, because we were really just going by the seat of our pants, because we really didn't have a lot of data on those other healthcare costs. We had tons of data about the virus. We could measure that, you know, we can measure it pretty good right now. We can do a PCR test, which is the gold standard, get that turned around 12 hours here in Nebraska, we'll know, boom, right away whether you got it with 95% accuracy. But what about suicides? 
Like that, that's a, what's causing it. And are we running at a higher rate? Those take a lot longer to collect the data. And so I think somebody who can look at that bigger picture of the other healthcare costs besides just whatever the current crisis is would also be a thing we can improve. President Bradley, you, you, you've thought a lot about this, this issue, um, and, but both from, in, from a, a number of different seats, right? with public health hat on and we're thinking about global institutions that could help us do better next time around. Can you, sure. can you give us your thoughts on this question? Yeah, I was um, thinking in response to your question, and I do agree again with what Governor Ricketts said. I think all of that is really important. Um, I'm just gonna take it up a notch, I think, to add on. Um, there are domestic things we have to do and there are international things we have to do. I think the domestic part, we have to look back. There actually was a pandemic preparedness unit that was very carefully crafted that included um, you know, representatives from the CDC, from the FDA, from HHS, and the button was to be pushed that if you get you know, Dr. Tedros from the WHO saying we have a public health emergency, the pandemic preparedness team starts to meet and they meet like a com like a command center, you know, as if you were under attack from a foreign body. And that got just totally taken apart um, with the Trump administration. That entire arm, that whole architecture was just eliminated. We have to have that back. Some system by which the CDC, the FDA, and the HHS are constantly talking, because then you would get the kind of holistic information that Governor Ricketts is asking for. You'd get the HHS thinking about suicide while the CDC is thinking about the virus. And you would get the FDA thinking ahead, what do we need for treatment, testing and treatment plans? That kind of collaboration collaboration just, it can happen and it just was taken apart. Um, so building that back up and I think also, you know, obviously if we had the money, um, capa building capacity of our public health arm, those are all county level public health officials. They are not, you know, generally MBAs. They're not thinking about the whole thing. They are at the county. They're not at the state. I mean, there are just so many things in our public health system that um, I think probably needs greater resources, unfortunately, than we have available at the moment. Um, on the international, I don't think this is a resource issue. Um, I actually work very closely with Dr. Tedros uh, at the WHO and you know, I've heard him say in public, um, you know, the money is one thing, I need the leadership. I need the United States to stand up and say, this is a global problem and we have to deal with it globally and start to actually trust a little bit more in the international bodies that a pandemic is not a national problem. It is a global problem. So you just can't solve it by a nation. You have to solve it in collaboration with other nations. And short of having a global governance system, which we don't have, we at least have the World Health Organization, the UN system that can support, I think. But the US is sort of phobic about being really multilateral like that and really collaborating, I think for fear that we'll end up holding the bag. But I think that fear is perhaps founded, but we still have to work through it and um, improve the kind of collaboration that we have to have for global pandemics. We, we talked a little bit off, offline about a, an, an analog that you've written about of a, almost like a UN Security Council, yeah. that right. level of, of right. institution, but for that level of global heft of, and, yeah, buy, and global buy-in, but for pandemics. And, imagine if the WHO had a WHO Security Council. Um, and when we look at the UN Security Council, you know, if there's an attack, I mean, that council gets going and people listen, I mean, a, a military attack. But, you know, now the enemy is a pathogen instead of, you know, an international terrorist. So I think the same kind of uh, international collaborative among the great powers is really needed. Uh, Rich, do you have any th th thoughts yeah, on this topic? Yeah, I, I, I think it's very clear that um, we weren't prepared for this. Uh, and even if there was, you know, stuff, you know, on the shelf someplace in Washington, you know, that somehow just disappeared. Uh, and then I think there was very bad planning. And that the outcomes, especially in dense populations, because Nebraska is not the same as New York, you know, has very, very different outcomes. And to, in, in fact, not have a top-down strategy, because frankly, the, the one strategy that proved to be the most successful was the vaccine strategy because the U.S. did have mm -hmm. a you know a federal strategy where they were willing to bet whatever how much they bet five billion or ten billion, and it's it, it is actually a medical you know it is a miracle that we have these effective vaccines, and we we shouldn't take it for granted. This is not the case in so many other countries around the world. So the private sector got onto this even as early as last January 
working on the basically the RNA versions that were needed to basically, these are the most effective um, and safe. But I, I think that we, we, there was just no preparedness for this. And then I think it, as t to allow every state and every you know, municipality, I understand they want control and they want to manage because every, you know, it shouldn't be a one size fits all. But you know, there should be sort of there should have been guidelines in terms of how to protect the most vulnerable populations. Because I think when we look back at where the deaths occurred, they occurred in the senior living centers. That's where the most of the crises were. And so it was like protect the vulnerable early on. And then you you needed um, you, you, you I, I keep coming back to, you know. If everyone has to come up with their own strategies and their own plans, some may be terrific. Governor Ricketts may have been the most brilliant governor for his circumstances, but that wasn't going to be the outcome in, in all 50 states. And, and that makes it a really chance. You get very uneven results, you know, with that. But we, were, we just were, there was no preparedness for this. And I think we'll be more prepared, you know, next time. But we weren't prepared from a supply standpoint. We weren't prepared from a medicine standpoint. And the... The differences of the decisions, you know, I, I think weeks, the, the, the weeks of, of decisions in New York City in particular, cost thousands of lives waiting to shut things down. Tens of, maybe even tens of thousands of lives. So these small decisions turn out to be big impacts. Yeah, I, was, I was struck listening to, to Governor Ricketts and, and President Bradley, exactly as you were. On the, on the one hand, this is such effective leadership at the level of their respective a state and, and an educational institution. On the other hand, how do you scale that? How do you get, how do you get that level of, of common sense and balancing trade-offs? And because this crisis required in, in some dimensions to just go all in and in other dimensions to, to, to really balance different you know, com, you know, com, complex factors pushing in different directions. And there was a lot of communications uh, a lot of communications challenge. So, you know, how do you how do you scale that so that you get good decision making, um, not just where you, ha you happen to have great leadership in place, but uh, but how do you scale that? We have two questions. You, Rich, you, you raised the the topic of vaccines, and we have two questions from the audience on on, on vaccines, and I'll, I'll I'll interject with with some of my own. But let me let me read the questions uh, from the audience. So one is with vaccines rolling out, perhaps reaching a peak, how will vaccine policies for the workforce, uh, workforce work? Will this, become, will this also become a politicized topic? And then second, the advice for parents of young children not eligible for vaccines, that's under 16, uh, seems to be conflicting. The politicizing of what parents should do has caused a lot of anxiety. Who should parents listen to? I noticed themes in both of these questions about, you know, what are the facts? How do we, um, what, what's going to, what's, 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 what are good decisions? How, what's gonna get politicized? Let me, let me put those questions uh, to the panel and then interject with some of my own about vaccines. Yeah, so, so I'll start. Um, you know, I, I actually think the universities have been you know, very forward leaning on this. Um, and at Brown, I think Brown was, Rutgers may have been the first and Brown and, and requiring vaccines to return to campus. Uh, and I think that's a very, very smart thing to do. I think it's very different when it comes to the office uh, and you know, companies are struggling with what they should do. And I think the narrative should be, we need to make our offices as safe as possible for all our employees. Cause everyone's gonna wanna know that it's a safe environment to get to the office. And when you're in the office, it's a safe environment. But I don't think it's gonna end up working certainly in the early days uh, as a requirement to do that. So I think what will probably happen is you'll have those who, you know, they'll keep track of who's, who has the vaccines, but the others I think are gonna be continue to be tested on a regular basis. And then the question is, as time goes on, you know, will that become a requirement? And then the other part of it, I think with respect to vaccines is going to big venues. You know, I was talking to the president of uh, University of Michigan at the beginning of this. And I said, well, how can you go to a Michigan Ohio State game, 102,000 fans, and not know who you're sitting next to. So I think that's gonna be a big, so I think the private sector is gonna end up leading this in terms of where will you, where will you require the equivalent of a vaccine pair passport? Uh, and, but because ultimately that, this is proven to be you know, the safe answer. With respect to younger people, I think the testing is going very, very well. And I think ultimately from what, all I know at this point is this is gonna apply 
and I have three young grandsons, this is going to apply to them in the shortest period of time. I think over the summer, young people are going to be getting vaccinated if, if their parents want them to be. Uh, and all indications are that they're going to be safe and effective. Yeah, I, I'd like to respond to that. Um, I totally agree with Brown and Mr. Friedman about requiring vaccination for students and we're doing the same thing. Um, it gets a little tricky with international students because if they've had the vaccine in China or Indonesia or Vietnam or wherever, do we take that vaccine? And I think we will, but you know, you wonder about that. I don't think we can double that vaccine and that science is still being developed, unfortunately, and this is gonna happen in the fall. I think for employees, it is a lot trickier. We've been doing a lot of um, getting legal advice on this and it's murky, very murky, whether you can require vaccination when it's still under emergency approval. It's not really official official. And I also know the NLRB um, did rule that it is a mandatory collective bargaining to topic. You can't just do it. If you have a union, you really have to bargain it. So um, we are preparing for not um, requiring for employees, but trying to do campaigns, everything you can. We have a dashboard to say how many have it, et cetera, to just get it be more voluntary to do it, which I think will um, work best. The trick, which I'll be very curious what others um, are gonna do about this is, once you know these people are vaccine, they aren't. You can't really ask because it's kind of personal health information. So, but if that's the case, you know, can you really have different rules? Like if you're not vaccinated, you you can't work in these areas or you can't, you have to wear a mask. And if you are vaccinated, you don't have to, but what kind of bizarre campus and community does that create? So curious what other what other people have ideas on that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, actually President Bradley, you're exactly right on the legality of it. Uh, our research shows is you cannot, at least as government, you cannot require anybody to get yeah. the vaccine because it's under emergency use authorization. Yeah. And I think just as a matter of public policy, it's a bad idea. I think that um, if you're a private college and you want to require that, you are well within your rights to do that. If you are a business, you want to require it. Same sort of thing. Now, I think you do have to worry about the HIPAA laws, um, you know, but you also have to consider there are people who cannot be vaccinated. Right. What do you do about those folks? Absolutely. There are people who immunologically cannot be vaccinated. So now we're going to say, well, we have a, a discriminated class of people who mm -hmm. can't work in the office place, who can't go to that University of Michigan game. I, th I think that's, I, I think the path, the, I, I'm against vaccine passports. I think the path we have to go down is around education. Same, the same way we got people to stay home in Nebraska, the same way we got them to adopt masks, not all of them did, but the way we got to do it is through education and getting people to that comfort level of getting the vaccines. And at some point we're just gonna say, guess what? If you wanna to go to the game and you're 65 and you didn't get the vaccine, you probably should wear a mask or don't go. Mm -hmm. right? You're more at risk. 84% yeah. of our deaths came from people who are 65 and older. So if, you, if you're in that category and you don't wanna get vaccinated, you probably shouldn't go. And then uh, when it comes to school aid kids, again, you can't require people to, uh, in general, but you certainly can't require kids right? Because the parents are the ones who make that decision. But it gets also back to the risk. Here in Nebraska, we've looked at our data. You're twice as likely to die as a child driving to school as you are getting COVID. Twice as likely to die just getting in the car, going to school. Okay, so that puts in a little bit of perspective of what kind of risk you're taking as a kid actually getting it. Now, that gets back to, well, what about the grandparents and everything like that? Well, that's why, well, again, if you're 65 or older, you really should get the vaccine. And that's where we have to educate people around that. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it gets back to what we talked about before is just, it's just a lot of communication. I mean, you, you cannot over communicate. You cannot talk to enough groups. You cannot get the message out from numerous sources enough to help make sure that people either are comfortable or at least they understand the risks they're taking by not getting the vaccine. We have about uh, eight or nine minutes left and I wanna put two, two last questions uh, to the panel, and I'd uh, be curious to, for, for Rich to hear from your perspective uh, as, as an investor or at Mount Sinai from President Bradley to hear about your perspective as a university leader and, and Governor Ricketts to hear from your perspective as a, as a, as a, as a leader of a state. Um, what, are you looking, what are you looking toward to in the next, let's say six months as key turning points that will, uh, what, what, are the, what are the milestones you're particularly attuned to that will help are, tell, are telling you and telling your organization that, we're, that things are, are, are getting back to normal or what are, you, what are you worried about in the next six to 12 months? And then long-term, what are some of the, 
uh, lasting ramifications that you are you're, uh, of this crisis period that you're you're anticipating or or just thinking about keeping you up at night? Uh, this is a fa fairly so, yeah, open-ended so, set yeah. of questions, but I'd like so, yeah, to so, on that. So from the you know from the hospital system standpoint, it's hospitalizations, as Governor Ricketts talked about, and that's a very specific thing. So. We're, a year ago, we were, had 2,200 hospitalizations across our eight hospitals. Today, we have 170. The second surge, we peaked at 550. Uh, and this is trending down 10% per week. So that's you know, one key metric. The next is the um, positivity rates. But I think we've actually, you know, unless things change, I, I think we're, we're, you know, we're on a fantastic path towards having essentially a manageable level of you know, quote unquote virus in the community. Um, you, you know, in certainly the, you know, the, let's call it the New York region. Um, and then I think this is going to be a better summer than last summer. And, you know, this issue is going to go away for now. I think with respect to, you know, the investments and Wall Street versus Main Street, this is like, I've never seen this in my career. Wall Street was looking way past this, uh, not only in the United States, but all around the world. Mm -hmm. And that the macro factors that are out there are looking way past COVID. The India equity markets are booming notwithstanding the fact that there are 350,000 new cases every day and 5,000 people dying every day. I've never seen such a disconnect between Main Street and Wall Street. Food insecurity, poverty, and, and obviously now the, you know, the U.S. You know, uh, you know, Biden reaction is you know, fiscal stimulus for the likes we've never seen before. And so I think there's no doubt we're going to have a lot of stimulus. The economy is going to be doing really well. And the question is going to be, okay, what are the consequences of six trillion uh, uh, so far? Because this is just, you know, this is just the first hundred days. Six trillion followed by whatever. And does anyone? We'll have to ask, you, you know, you know, Eric, you and your other colleagues, do deficits ever matter again? And does monetary modern monetary theory play in here, or, or can we just keep printing ever, ever, ever? Um, I don't think you'll find any of my colleagues who are, are modern monetary theory folks. This is talk about new territory, right? This is new yeah, territory. Yeah. And in theory, you know, the dollar should be weakening, but against what? And, um, you know, you know, this is, this is going to be a, the most stimulated economy. It's already doing well. But um, this difference between Main Street and Wall Street I've never seen before. And the question is, will that, what consequences will that be on a social basis? And that's what I think, you know, the current administration is trying to do is address that. We'll see. President Bradley? Yeah, boy, do I agree. Um, the markers we're looking at uh, for our future is the percent of people vaccinated, um, whether we need boosters or not, and then how that's going to work. Um, I'm also very interested in the change in work you know, change in work. Like people aren't going to work in offices. They're going to work in the Hudson Valley when actually their office is in New York City. And with that, the change in demography, where people are going to live, is there going to be an exodus from exodus from cities? I, I don't know. Those things all seem like really interesting um, dashboards to think about. Um, I do, in terms of the worries longer term, you know, I'm a little worried about our international collaboration in education. That is the root of great education, the way people collaborate across. I mean, think what we learn from China, from India, and what we give. Um, and I worry a little bit about that now with a uh, stemming of the travel. Um, that makes me nervous, although we're doing a lot on Zoom, obviously. Um, and I worry about the next pandemic, to tell you the truth. You know, as a public health person, we, uh, you know, this field's been predicting a pandemic like. Um, coronavirus for, you know, two decades. And actually the list is a lot longer of these airborne, um, you know, very scary viruses. So um, I still think about that actually. And all the investments we're making now, I, sorry to say, I think we're gonna keep using them. Um, and the last thing that I'm a little, I'm worried about, but I think um, Mr. Friedman, I really like what you said is the equity issue, the difference between Wall Street and Main Street. And if Biden's, you know, $4 billion impetus in childcare and early childhood education, you know, that is going to make a huge difference, but can we pay for it? You know, what's it going to do on the long run? Governor Ricketts? Yeah, I, th I think short term, again, we're just get people vaccinated so that we can really knock this down. <clears throat> so when we get to, a, we're, we're pretty close to the level of hospitalizations in Nebraska where I mean, we're not going to really have, I mean, we're going to take off the the requirement to quarantine and isolate pretty soon if we just keep seeing, if we keep seeing our hospitalizations decline. So I think that that's part of it. And as far as getting people to go back to normal, there's just an article in the Wall Street Journal today about Gibraltar, who is vaccinated. Uh, I'm trying to think of the number. It's a huge number of their population. 
uh, has taken the vaccine because they're a part of the UK. And they've pretty much thrown away all the rules. And what they're finding is that people are going back to normal life pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So I, I get less concerned about people going back to normal life. And I see it here in Nebraska where we really don't have any restrictions. And you see uh, people going back to the restaurants and bars and things like that. So I, I don't get too twisted up about that. I do think that this is something we're going to have to continue to have. I mean, look, the coronavirus is not going away. So we may need boosters in the future. This may be like more like the flu shot, except you really have to get it this time as opposed to like the flu shot was like really kind of strongly recommended. Uh, so we're going to have to continue to manage this, uh, you know, forever. There's always going to be coronavirus around now. And so we're always going to have to manage it. We're always going to have to think about, do we need to get those shots or whatever? Or, or will our immunization keep us through? And then finally, I, I just couldn't agree more with what Rich and President Bradley said with regard to uh, the stimulus. I think the economy short term is going to be very good because of all the stimulus. We certainly see our state revenues are vastly exceeding our forecasts. Um, and it's in large part because of the huge amount of stimulus. But we can already see the inflation creeping in, whether it's in lumber prices, steel prices, um, you know, coming from an agricultural state where we had corn around three to 350 through most of my term and everybody in the ag economy was really hurting because the commodity price was so low. Corn's up now almost to $7, it's almost doubled. Well, in some cases it has doubled. So that's, that's also something that I don't know how sustainable that price is from, you know, if it goes up that high and comes back down, that's one thing. If it goes up and keeps going up, that says something else. So I'm very concerned about, you know, the amount of money that we are printing essentially and what does that mean long-term to this, the fiscal stability of our economy? And um, so that, that's something that is very concerning to me, but that, that's really probably my biggest long-term concern with regard to where the economy goes. And ultimately that's what creates jobs and people to allow them to go to the family vacation and buy a house, send their kids to school. I mean, that's, that's really, you know, the, 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 the freedom that we have to be able to have the free enterprise system is really what drives all this prosperity. And I'm very concerned about long-term where this is going. Thank you very much. I mean, in a way, we just thinking ahead to the next pandemic, in a way we caught a break with this one in that the, we figured out kind of early where the mortality risk was highest. We figured out kind of early how to, how to manage that, the, the risk. We, we got vaccines within nine months. So not knock wood, we're, we're, we're so lucky uh, next time. One way in which we weren't lucky was just the, the massive disparate impacts, right? The Wall Street, Main Street disparity. And if you have a job like mine, it sucks teaching from Zoom, but it's part of my language, but like, you know, it's, life goes on. Um, but four out of 10 households lost income or, or lost a job, right? So it's just, the dis and that's part of what's driving the, 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 fiscal response, but we'll, and we'll, the, the trade-offs are as the panelists have discussed. But let me just conclude by thanking the, these remarkable panelists and alumni leaders for, for their service this past year and for, for a really lively panel discussion. I, I've taken uh, two, uh, two slogans that I will, will use in the future. One is, we precedes me. All right. And then the second is, I don't know who this Vassar guy is. In there, okay. What's that? <laughs> and then put Vassar in that. It's a little we yeah, right. Vassar, sure. And then the other is, I don't know who this guy is, but he seems depressed. I think that's going to be a Zoom, <laughs> a Zoom slogan going forward. But th th thank you very much for, uh, for your service and for this great panel discussion. And uh, you know, keep, keep it up for the, these next six months and, and beyond. And, and I thank, thank you on behalf of all the, uh, the audience members with us virtually as well. Thank Great. You. Thank 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 you.